Well, good morning again, brethren, and it's a, a delight to be able to see you. I'm glad we can meet together on the Sabbath as we, we customarily do, as God directs. And uh, certainly a very pretty day. Uh, gorgeous clouds again today. Actually, I thought this last week, at least in Kansas City, we had some gorgeous clouds. They weren't storm clouds. They were just nice, puffy, white clouds that were just beautiful. Today was a little different. You know, as I was driving into the cloud bank coming over, uh, I could uh, see a, enjoy a different type of cloud, which I certainly very much like to do. I wanted to begin the sermon today uh, going through a little bit of information that I read here several weeks ago. Uh, it was talking about how it is that people today, and I think we see this uh, with the people that we interact with, whether at work or whether in school or uh, just even here at church, but of course we know each other quite well, uh, but people today are suffering. They're suffering from a great deal of stress. They are, in a sense, upset and probably many different causes for that. Uh, some, some would say that uh, the pandemic has caused some of that, and certainly it, it's created a lot of con conflict and confusion and distress with work or with school. Some of our young people here are starting back to school, uh, I think this past week, and uh, if not, this coming week anyway. And so, you know, those are, there are a lot of different reasons that people are, are stressed out. And some, uh, even uh, to the point of beyond stress and being just burned out. That's the way people, in a sense, seem. And in an article that I've printed out here for me to use here today, uh, this article written by Leslie Finley, uh, that was on a website, the thehealthy.com website, uh, was entitled just that, Beyond Burnout. What to do when stress reaches epidemic proportions. And so it's something that we not only want to be concerned about regarding the world, as far as the people who are affected by this, but also for us. So I want to read a little bit of this article uh, it says, America is seriously stressed out. According to the American Institute of Stress, even before the pandemic, 94% of workers said that they regularly feel stressed. And so not only over the last year or two, but even before that, people feel stressed. And more recently, the American Psychological Association reported that the country's collective stress has reached alarming levels and we all get busy sometimes, but feeling constantly and chronically swamped, worried, and overwhelmed can lead to burnout, which can have some very serious consequences. And so, of course, you know, we want to be familiar with this. It describes in this article what they are talking about regarding burnout. Burnout is a response to facing prolonged chronic stressors that go beyond your ability or available resources to overcome. And so in a sense, you're just kind of out of control. Uh, you don't know where to turn. You don't know what to do. It goes on to explain that burnout combines three key dimensions. And I think it's good for us to realize what these are. One of them is just overwhelming exhaustion. Overwhelming exhaustion. If we get so exhausted, you know, then that is going to elevate our stress level possibly to the point of being burned out. The first one they mention is overwhelming exhaustion, feeling and leading to a feeling of cynicism. And again, I think that's what we see in many people today uh, when they don't see clear answers, where they don't see great benefit or progress for themselves, and they feel like they're getting further and further behind, uh, then becoming cynical is, is very easy to do. And finally, 
a sense of discouragement or inadequacy or low accomplishment. Now, these are the things that this, this article points out. It goes ahead in the remainder of the article to, to express what they think might help, what might, pe what might help people if they realize that they are, are affected by this. And the things that are mentioned are actually uh, somewhat helpful. Uh, it says, before the stress in your life ramps up to this level, know what experts say that are proactive steps that you can take to prevent burnout. You know, the first one deals with, and they explain this in, in their own terms, uh, but look for meaning. Look for meaning in your work, or in a sense, in your life. If you don't have meaning, it says, we can tolerate stress longer if we believe we're doing something purposeful and worthwhile. Now, do you feel that in whatever work you do, some of you are still working, some of you are not at that age at this time, but it helps to have something that you're doing that you feel is worthwhile. And of course, it points that out here, purposeful and worthwhile. They go ahead to say you know, that, that that's going to be beneficial. The second thing they mention is look for meaning uh, even outside of work, maybe some kind of a diversion or some type of hobby. And I think some of you have hobbies that are uh, kind of a diversion from what you commonly do. The third thing that they mention is don't neglect yourself. And here they're talking about uh, nutrition, uh, physical activity. You know, those are obviously things that would help lower stress levels for anybody anywhere and so you know, we don't want to neglect that and finally you know the thing they mention in this article is recognize when it's just become too much you know be able in a sense to say I've got so much to do I've got I'm overwhelmed by what I'm needing to do uh, that I need to be able to cut back and I I kind of summarize that in my own head recognize when to simplify your life. Sometimes you have to just decide, well, okay, some things are more important than others and I just don't need to do the ones that take up time that are not as important. And so certainly some of these suggestions could be a benefit to all of us uh, at times. And so I, I offer that as, as kind of an introduction uh, to what I titled this sermon as coping with stress uh, with God's help because that clearly is something that we are blessed with. We have the help of God. He's clearly available. He clearly wishes to help us. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to grow. So as Christians... We need to think, are we completely immune to the hectic, stressful life here at the end of the age? <laughs> no. You know, we're, we're affected by it. Whether we know it, whether we believe it, whether we recognize it, you know, we can be affected by it as well. And since we are in the process of overcoming, all of us have that as a goal, a responsibility toward God that we want to be overcoming, but shouldn't we realize that there are lapses, there are ups and downs, often even, you know, how we feel, how, what our health is, and you know, whenever we're struggling with a, uh, some kind of a health issue, then that, that causes us to be down. And then when it gets a little better, then, then we're up, and then we may go down again. There, there's a lot of different factors here uh, that you could discuss but are not lapses, ups and downs, uh, what we should expect. We should expect that living in this world and with the complications that we find here at the end time, shouldn't we expect that there would be ups and downs? But I think we should also think, should we be suffering from stress in the same way that everyone does? Shouldn't we be able to figure out how to handle that, again, from the Word of God? 
because that's, you know, the book that God has given us, the instruction book, the truth that he has implanted in our heart and mind and that he says, you know, that we want to focus on that word. You know, I think it's interesting to see the biblical examples uh, that we can learn from because, you know, Jesus was the only person who ever lived who was completely perfect and never sinned, of course, uh, but had everything under control. He was always, you know, in a, uh, and there were times that he was clearly going through difficulty and clearly that was going to be the case toward the end of his life, but even at other times. He was at, upset a little at the money changers in the temple. You know, that was, that was disturbing to him because he could see how wrong that was. And so uh, he took care of, of that problem. What about David? You know, aren't there ups and downs in David's life? Some of those we're quite familiar with. Some of his sins, some of his problems. Some of those he clearly brought on himself. But other, if you read the book of Psalms, you see many of those written by David are, you know, they're, they express, you know, deep distress, difficulty, difficulty even sleeping, difficulty from, you know, different things that he was suffering at times. I think you, even though, you know, David has an overall very positive uh, outcome for his life, and he has some very positive things said about him uh, in the Bible and, and about his role in the future, about a king overall under Christ, of course, but a king over Israel. And so, you know, David would be a good example of some ups and downs. And so all of us, you know, need to recognize that about our lives. I'd like for us to also look at uh, one of the prophets here that we can read about. In the Old Testament, uh, this particular one is Jonah. What about Jonah? Jonah, if you want to turn to Jonah, we'll read a few verses wherever Jonah is here. I can tell you it's on page 753. Uh, you have to kind of look through the minor prophets here to find the book of Jonah. It's not very long, so only have four chapters. And, of course, I'm not wanting to go through the entirety of this book. I just want to mention a few things. I think you'd have to say that after Jonah had done the work that God had given him to do, and, of course, he tried to run away from that. He, he didn't want the job. He wanted to get away. He experienced what would seem to be a remarkable event uh, with the fish. And then being spit out on the ground and then reluctantly going and doing the job, uh, whenever he told the Ninevites, you need to change, <laughs> they did. They said, whoa, we, we need to turn around. We, we need to follow God. We need to learn about God. But how was Jonah uh, responsive, uh, responding to that great turnaround? Nineveh responded. They repented. But if we look here in chapter 4, what was Jonah's response? You know, he did his job. It was a difficult job. It wasn't something he really liked to do or wanted to do, but it was something God directed him to do. In chapter 4, it says, Jonah was displeased because the people repented. He was displeased, and he became very angry. You know, he, he could have been glad he had a message for the enemies of Israel. You need to repent, or God is going to punish you. And so they did repent, and so God said, okay, I won't punish. Jonah was even upset about what God decided to do. He goes on, verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country. That's why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. He said, I told you, God, I told you. I, I knew what you were like. I knew you would be merciful. I knew 
that I don't want them, I want them to be punished. That was, that was again the biblical example of Jonah. And so he, he expressed that. He says, why, why did I even do my job? I, I think you could say he was getting cynical. He was cynical about the outcome. And in verse 3, he says, now, Lord, please take my life. I, I want to die. I don't even want to continue to do the job or to be a kind of servant from, for God. I don't want to take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. And, of course, in verse 4, God says, Is this right, Jonah, for you to be angry like this? Is this right for you to be so upset and so, in a sense, cynical about what I brought about? It goes on. Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat down to the east of the city, made a booth for himself. He sat under the booth in the shade, waiting to see what would happen, see what God was going to do. Was he really going to be merciful? Was he going to pick them back up? In verse 6, the Lord appointed a bush or gourd and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from the discomfort. Okay, here he, he's distressed. He's frustrated. Uh, he's... he's uh, wanting comfort he's wanting to be consoled and it says Jonah was very happy about this this shade that was being provided but of course as we know when dawn came up the next day God appointed a worm to attack the bush and it died and so ups and downs that's what we see in Jonah's chapter 4 here what Jonah was going through but you know whenever the worm attacked the gourd in verse 8, when the sun arose, God prepared a sultry east wind. The sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked him that he, again, asked that he might die. He says, it's better for me to die than to live. See, now I think you have to say Jonah again was up and down. Uh, he was stressed. He was discomforted. You know, I, you know, I think all of us think about that whenever... Uh, hot outside and we, we're, we can't get inside or even if it, we're in the shade doesn't seem to help or even sometimes in our house seems like we should be getting better cooling out of our conditioning system but it's still hot or it's still cold the, the discomfort just kind of irrit causes you to be irritated and so I don't know that we could say I don't know that we could say that Jonah uh, was coping with the stresses in his life too well. And, like I said, you know, what we read about David is that he had a lot of ups and downs. And sometimes he's appealing to God to get me out of this mess or to rescue me or to revive me. Are we like that? Well, sometimes I think we can say we are. What about Elijah? Now, Elijah you know, is, is an interesting prophet that we read about and primarily here in 1 Kings. Uh, we see Elijah mentioned in several other places in the Bible and Elijah is going to be, you know, very prominently featured in the world to come. Uh, you see him in a, a vision with Moses and Jesus in Matthew 17. And yet, what about Elijah? Let's look at chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. There, there are a number of chapters here, 17 and 18 and 19, you know, that talk about Elijah and, of course, his interaction later with his protege, protege uh, Elisha. He was going to follow Elijah in the role that he had. But here in 1 Kings chapter 19, even after you know, the unbelievable blessing that God had provided for him to have a victory over the priests of Baal, and if our young people want to read something that's pretty funny, you can read chapter 18 here. Read chapter 18 and you see the confrontation. We might go through some of that. You see the confrontation between Elijah and 
the king of Israel, Ahab, and his wife Jezebel, and their false worship. And of course, the latter part of that is really quite humorous because Elisha is mocking them. Again, we might read through that, but after that, let's look at chapter 19. I need to get back there here. 1 Kings chapter 19. After Elijah had, had put to death the false prophets of Baal, the priests of Baal, after he had successfully, and actually, actually after it started raining again, because it hadn't been raining for three and a half years. You know, actually, when you read about Elijah, you know, he, he's a pretty quirky guy. Pretty, pretty odd. I mean, from the ways that he was dressed, from the thing, how he looked, to the way that he just kind of disappeared sometimes. You know, he didn't, didn't, he wasn't easy to find. And even Obadiah, I think this is in chapter 17, or 18, I guess, Obadiah describes an interaction with Ahab, and Ahab's been looking for Elijah because he wants to know what to do. Of course, he's not going to do it, but he at least wanted to know what, what does God say we should do. And yet, Obadiah, when he found Elijah, and Elijah actually came to him, showed himself, uh, then he says, well, you know, Ahab is really upset. He is just, he is about to blow a cork. He is off his rocker trying to find you. And then nobody, he goes through the land. He makes people, you haven't seen him. And if you do see him, you let, he's threatening everybody. And he's, you know, likely to kill people. And Elijah comes to Obadiah and says, okay, uh, here I am. And Obadiah says, and he says, go tell the king. And Obadiah says, uh, well, I don't really know if I want to go tell, tell the king because whenever I come back here, have the king come and you'll be gone again. You will disappear. Not that you, you know, are doing that on purpose, but the king is really rabid about what's going on, about how he can't find you, can't locate you. And, and yet that was kind of a part. Of course, Elijah's going to disappear some other times too. And even in dealing with Elisha, he, he does some somewhat odd things. But of course, you know, the spirit and the power of Elijah is referenced as, you know, a great thing. But here in verse 1 of chapter 19, Ahab had told Jezebel all that Elijah, Elijah had done, how he killed all the prophets with the sword. And of course, that threw Jezebel into a real uh, hissy fit. And she, it was even worse than that. You know, this, this was uh, damaging toward her. And so she sent a messenger to Elijah and says, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. I'm going to kill you tomorrow. And so in verse 3, he was afraid. Now here, he had just, he had just caused not that he caused it, but he had asked, and God did send rain. He did send a victory over the priest of Baal. God had done some remarkable. Now, maybe, maybe it was just a quirk that lightning blew up the altar. Now, maybe that was just, that's probably what some of the people thought, but of course, I think many of the Israelites who were gathered around there watching it, well, you know, Elijah is uh, the priest of God or a priest of God and God is able to do anything. And so here we find shortly after this and even after being seemingly uh, super powered to be able to run before the chariot, I don't know how he was able to do that without God's help, but in verse 3 he says he was afraid and he got up and he fled for his life. He came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. You know, Elijah is down, very down. He is down so much, goes on in verse 4, 
He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, left his servant, goes in the wilderness, came and sat down under a solitary broom tree, asked to die. I, I, I just want to die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. See, that again uh, shows a great deal of distress. Now, he wasn't really coping with the stressful job he had too well. And yet you can see in the biblical examples of different people that we would, we would certainly know that God was with and that he was providing different uh, interventions for Israel. These prophets, Jonah, David as the king, Elijah as a primary prophet, you know, they were deeply distressed. And so, you know, what, what do we learn whenever we read these things? Well, we realize, as it says back in James, that Elijah was just a human person. He, he was just like us. And all of us, you know, we have somewhat of an ordinary, regular lifetime. Uh, we, we hope we live out our life and then die at whatever time God would permit that or allow that. But Elijah was just a, a regular person. He, I'm sure he was elated when he saw some of the things that God did. But then shortly thereafter, he's in the dumps. He, he is not coping well uh, with the stress that he is suffering. So I think we ought to think about you know, how all of us can cope better with stress if we realize that clearly we have God's help. See, this is something that you would have to say, Elijah, he wasn't thinking about that whenever he was saying, I just want to die. I'm, I'm done. I'm no better than my ancestors. See, I've, I've written down six things here that may be beneficial to us. As I read in this article earlier, there, there may be some physical things that we could do and ways we could look at our lives and the things that are difficult for us. But there's even more that we can think about uh, when we re recall, you know, that God is clearly very interested in us. He's, he's drawn us to Jesus Christ. That is a primary thing that all of us have to understand. He's drawn us to Jesus Christ, who is the head of his church. And he has brought us to an awareness of his involvement in our lives. And he has actually blessed us. With the Spirit of God, a Spirit that is completely foreign to the world. And that is important for us to be fully aware of. But how can we better cope with stress when we realize we have God's help? Well, first of all, we need to recognize our human failings are well known to God. Does God know what was going on in Elijah's life? Did he, he know what was happening? Does he know what Elijah was thinking? Well, sure. As we read, and we will read some more here in chapter 19, about what he was going to tell Elijah to do. But see, God is well aware of the strain or the stress that we have, so recognize our human failings are well known to God. Remember, second thing, remember that God has a great purpose for calling us today. You know, if we forget that or if we... Not that we forget it entirely, but we're just not focusing on it. Remember that God has a great purpose for calling us today. The third thing, realize that God is greater than any of the obstacles that we're facing. See, again, these are pretty obvious things, but I think it's good for us to, you know, to realize that, well, with the help of God, we can handle the stresses that we face the difficulties that we are asked to travel through in our faith journey, because that's really what we're all on. Number four, we can also realize, and this is brought out with uh, Elijah, exhaustion really is a contributor to stress being so bad that we get burned out, you know, that we become unproductive. Exhaustion can greatly contribute to our stress levels. 
The fifth thing I'll mention is that what is it that Elijah said? What is it that he said about himself in relationship to everybody else? He said, I'm the only one left. I'm, I'm doing all the work. I'm doing what you told me to do. And of course, as you read it, it seems kind of erratic, you know, what God would ask him to do at different times. But he says, I'm the only one left. And God said, no, you're not. There are others. See, he was feeling that he was isolated. He was feeling that he was cut off. And see, that's why whenever we're isolated from our brethren, we come and we try to, we're supposed to be picking each other up, supposed to be encouraging each other, uh, even so much the more as we see the day approaching. You know, that's part of why God asks us not only to come together and, and try to help each other, but see, we realize that, you know, isolation can cause us to even feel worse, that we can be, you know, stressed out over that. And the last thing I'll mention is clearly to know that God has given us a mission. A mission that gives us a meaningful purpose in our lives. And so these are at least some of the things that I think could be, could be thought about regarding how it is that we can cope with the stresses that this world has and that we are affected by, uh, but knowing that we have God's help. Let's go back to 1 Kings 17. See, what are the things that Elijah was going through? See, we've already mentioned that he's at a point to where he wants, he wants to give up. I, I just want to die. I, I don't want to have to do anything more. I'm not going to be confronting any more people. The king hates me, of course. See, Ahab, the king of Israel, <laughs> called Elijah the troubler of Israel. He didn't call him the prophet of Israel. He called him the troubler of Israel. Now, why was that? Well, let's see here in chapter 17, verse 1, Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, the king of Israel, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And so the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go from here, turn east, hide yourself by this brook, Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the wadi, that brook, and I will command the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by that Wadi, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the wadi. But after a while, the wadi dried up because there wasn't any rain in the land. Okay, obviously God was taking care of him. Now, I don't know that I would enjoy uh, the birds bringing me some food. But, of course, that's what it says, that he brought him bread and brought him meat of some type. That, that's maybe beside, but what, what was going on was that Elijah had said, there shall neither be dew nor rain these years except by my word. And we find that it's, it's going to be three and a half years before that's going to be changed where God will send rain with a little cloud out in the Mediterranean Sea. And so you find that this type of blessing was afforded to Elijah. If we go on to chapter 18, I'm not going to read all the accounts, but you can read chapter 17 and 18 and 19 here, primarily about Elijah, and it's really amazing. In some remarkably uh, uh, interesting, see again, even for our young people, you can read this and it, it's kind of exciting actually. Sometimes you have to wonder how in the world could that happen, but with God nothing is impossible. And so that's what we find. In chapter 18, you see the account of Obadiah trying to find Elijah, and eventually he is brought to King Ahaz. In verse 20, Ahab, or excuse me, not Ahaz, Ahab, Ahab sent to the Israelites, verse 20 of Chapter 18, 
assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you limp between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, then you ought to follow him. The people didn't answer. But down a little bit later, he describes what he's going to do. Uh, here in verse 22, Elijah says, I, even I only, am left of the prophets of God, of the, of the Lord. But Baal's prophets number 450. But let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves to cut it in pieces, to lay it on the wood, to put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And then we will call on the name of the Lord. And I will call on the name of the Lord, or, or you shall call on the name of your God, Baal. And I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire is indeed God. And all the people said, okay, great, well spoken. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourself which bull you want, prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, and put no fire to it. So they took the bull that was given them, in verse 26, and prepared it and called on the name of Baal all day, from the morning until noon, I guess half the day, and choose for yourself. They took the bull that was given them, and they were, let's see, verse 25, Elijah said, Choose for yourself one bull and prepare it first, for you are, you are many. They call on the name of your God, put no fire to it. So you shall take, they took the bull that was given them, prepared and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, crying, O Baal, answer us, for there was, but there was no voice, there was no answer. And they jumped around all over, over and around the altar. Verse 27, at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, surely he is a god. Either he is meditating or he maybe has wandered off or maybe has gone to the bathroom. Now that was in essence what was being said. Maybe he's meditating Maybe he's wandered away. Maybe he's in a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. And then they cried aloud and it was their custom, as was their custom, they cut themselves with swords and lances until the blood gushed, and gushed out over them. They, they were even, uh, that was a part of their uh, kind of a approach to their understanding of this false god, Baal, and maybe that'll help some type of a human sacrifice. At midday, as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the evening, oblation, but there was no voice and no answer and no response. And so, of course, that didn't work, as we know. But if we drop down to verse 36, at the time of the evening, or offering of the oblation, in the evening, Prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham. Oh, well, I don't want to skip this part up here. Uh, let me back up to verse uh, 31. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, for whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench around the altar large enough to contain two measures of seed and next he put a wood, uh, the wood in order. He cut the bull in pieces. He laid it on the wood. And so after he got his altar and after he put the bull on there, got the wood and the bull, then he drenches it with water. Next he put the wood on the altar. He cut the bull in pieces. He said, let fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And then he said, do it again and do it another time. And they did it the third time so that the water all round down or went round the altar and filled the trench with water. With water. And so he, he had the offering prepared in a similar way and then, of course, drenched it with water. And at the time, verse 36 of the 
evening came, Elijah came near, O Lord God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done these things at your bidding. Answer me, O God, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. And so in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, consumed the wood, consumed the stones and the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. And so quite a magnificent response from God to be able you know, to completely consume this, this offering. In verse 39, when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Certainly the Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. And Elijah said, Seize the prophets of Baal. And of course, Elijah then brought them down to the brook and killed them there. So this was obviously a great victory. A great victory, not only for Elijah, but for what the people could learn about how they should respect and honor God. And the rest of the section here in chapter 18 discusses how it is that Elijah then is going to pray for rain and God is going to send it. And so he did. He sent that rain and ultimately Elijah had to race ahead of the chariot in order to get out of the rain. Now we read parts of here in chapter 19, that after this, Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, Elijah. I'm going to kill you like you just killed my prophets of Baal. And, of course, Elijah, in verse 3, is afraid. He flees. He went to Beersheba. He asked that he would die, in verse 4. He says, it's enough, O Lord. Take away my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. See, he... He had to be on an incredible high and then an incredible low, but he was needing to be reminded of what we read here now in the rest of chapter 19. It says in verse 5, he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. And suddenly an angel touched him and said, get up, I want you to eat. I don't want you to be exhausted because in your exhausted state you're obviously kind of thinking unclearly you're not dealing with this stressful issue very well you could be looking to God you could be asking for help but he says I want you to eat get up and eat and he looked and there at the head of the uh, at his head was a cake baked on hot stones a jar of water and so he ate and drank and lay down again the angel came a second time and touched him, get up and eat there, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of it food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And at that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. And so here we see God continuing to deal with Elijah. He understood his failings. He understood his weakness. He recognized uh, that Elijah had to realize he needed help. He was exhausted. He needed to eat and drink. As I mentioned, one of the things that was pointed out, you know, we need to have as good a diet as we can or as we choose to do. And some activity is helpful. These things could apply to this. But in verse 9, at that place, he came to the cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. And what did it say? What did it say in verse 9? It says, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, that was, that was actually a point that was going to be mentioned uh, a couple of times. What Elijah was not thinking about right at that time was that God was well aware of everything and that God was able to change things as he saw fit. And that he was able to encourage and bring him out of, you know, the stresses of the problems that he was facing. And so he says, what are you doing here, 
And he says in verse 10, I've been zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites, but the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altar and killed your prophets, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. See, he thought, I'm the only one. And of course, God is going to tell him, well, that's not the case. I won't go through the next section here about how it is that God's going to come to him. But finally, you know, there was silence. In verse 13, Elijah, Elijah heard the still small voice. And he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. There again, this same voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? And he again said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. But the Israelites have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets. And I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. And the Lord said, and so here it was that God was going to give, tell him, you know, you, you have a mission from me. You have purpose in your life. You need to be about doing my work. It doesn't do you any good to be off, in a sense, pouting or being burned out over the problems that you're facing because I'm bigger than all of those problems. But he goes ahead to say, the Lord said, I want you in verse 15 to go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Go back. He, he, he had moved quite a distance to the south from where he had been. And so I want you to go back. And when you arrive, I want you to anoint Hazel as king over Aram. And I also want you to anoint Jehu as king over Israel. And I want you to anoint Elisha as prophet in your place. And he describes in verse 18, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. He said, there are others that are supportive of what you are doing and what I am doing with the people. And so... You see, the answer, in a sense, was that God gave him a mission. He, I'm not going to go through, obviously, the time. i uh, not going to go through what it was he eventually did and how it was he eventually would interact with Elisha and kind of pass on the role that he had to Elisha. But the point is simply that Elijah was reminded of the mission. He was reminded of the mission that he had been given to do. And so when we face difficult times, when we are living during a time when it's very stressful, you know, we never want to forget that God is well aware of what we're going through, that we can remember he has a purpose for calling us today to realize he's greater than any obstacle we face, Understand that exhaustion can lead us to being down, and so we want to try to avoid that as we can. Realizing the benefit of if we think we're all alone, well, then we're not. We're all here to help each other. You know, we have a work to do. We have a role to achieve the proclaiming of the gospel around the world, and that God has given us that meaning, just as he had given Elijah, and of course, you see Elisha passing on the role that he had to Elisha, Elijah to Elisha. And then you see Elijah later writing letters and you know he was doing he, he was actually carried off not up to heaven but over into another area and then he was still alive and he was writing letters about things that God would direct him to do, but he was not in the same role as he had been here in 1 Kings 17 and 18 and 19. And so, you know, we want uh, to be reminded whenever God was saying, what are you doing, Elijah? He was reminding him uh, that, well, you've got to keep in mind, you know, you, you are, are called by the great God to do whatever I wish, whatever I want you to do. And God had given him a mission and he wanted him to continue to do uh, that work that God had given him. And of course, the same thing applies to us. 
If we look over at Matthew 24, we'll close with this. Matthew 24 tells us, of course, as we approach the days, the days that will lead up to the coming of Jesus Christ. And what we are called to do today as a church. In verse 45, who then? Matthew 24, 45, who then is a faithful and wise slave or servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give to other servants their allowance, food at the proper time? Blessed, in verse 46, is that servant whom his master will find hard at work, at work whenever he comes. See, that's what all of us want to be engaged in doing. So regardless of what type of stressors that we find in this world, you know, certain physical factors can help, but also aware of how it is that we cope with stress with God's help. And with that help, uh, we can be fully successful.